Um, let's take a look here, guys. So I saw this yesterday on Twitter. Pretty shocked because at this point, actually, the breaking point segment in question had not even dropped yet. So someone sent Destiny this clip when it was still just for the members only, the members of the Breaking Points community that pay to get all their content early, whatever, right? So I was like, damn, what what, what did I miss? Um, luckily, now the clip is available, so we're going to watch it and review it. But Destiny basically said, would love to have the Israel-Palestine debate I had with either Crystal Ball or Sagar and Jetty in any format, digital or live. I've never heard so much misinfo about this in my life. I imagine Crystal never bothered to watch it and is exclusively reading off of her teleprompter for the segment, which is pretty funny because it was a radar. Which, which she is always like, reads the teleprompter yeah, for. She writes what she then reads off the teleprompter. So yeah, that's you're literally just describing how the segment works, Destiny. Um, it's not like she's just reading something that, you know, someone else he's wrote a real for investigative her. journalist. He's got he's he wants everybody to know he's got the scoop. She you know, she wrote her monologue of the morning. Yeah, no shit. Which I mean I get it if you're a streamer and you're a dumbass like Destiny and you don't understand that there are different formats of news broadcasting and that obviously it doesn't mean that somebody else is putting words in your mouth just because you write your own f monologue because you want to make a point about something specific. Uh anyway pretty crazy uh, i didn't watch the portion where sagar gets a chance to interview uh like um respond but i thought that crystal was perfectly level-headed i don't think that there's an anything that uh you know basically destiny's just coping and seething because she highlighted the fact that norm got him by the balls multiple times yep destiny's doing that thing that he loves to do where it's like you point out something obvious and then he acts and overreacts and pretends that you've just said something insanely outlandish. You know, I'll be like, hey, you really got destroyed in that debate. And he's like, what? How could any thinking logical person come to that conclusion unless you're a grifting lunatic? And it's like, bro, everyone saw it with their own eyes. You've been getting tucked on and roasted all across Twitter. It's not like Crystal came to some like, insanely rare and hard to understand conclusion that no one else reached um it's pretty obvious actually the conclusion that she reached and we're about to take a look at that to find out if in fact it's accurate that there was so much misinformation the most misinformation i've ever heard in my entire life and that's what we're about to expose you guys to so apologies in advance None of it was true. It was all lies. The people lied about me. The reporters lied about me. Why do we hate the press? We hate the press because they tell lies. They don't know anything about the truth. I love the truth. Me, I tell the truth. I love the truth. Nothing but truth coming from me, but the reporters and the media and the lies and the... Tr the yeah, anyway, that's, that's <laughs> basically destiny, but he's the liberal version of Donald Trump. Yep, 100%. Anyway, let's take a look here. Norm Finkelstein dog walks Destiny in Israel debate. Uh, damn, this is a 28-minute long clip, so I don't think we're going to probably watch the entirety of it. No. <laughs> but let's at least take a look Finish at it on breaking this. points, you know? They don't yeah. need your views, but we're encouraging it anyway. Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Podcaster Lex Friedman recently hosted a roughly five-hour-long debate on Israel-Palestine that was frustrating, combative at times, but nevertheless, extraordinarily revealing. The debate featured author and scholar Norman Finkelstein, analyst and researcher Moeen Rabani, arguing the Palestinian perspective. On the pro-Zionist side, you had author and historian Betty Morris and YouTuber Stephen Bennell, also known as Destiny. Now, if your immediate reaction is that one of these individuals doesn't quite fit in with the rest, you are correct. And it was painfully obvious the entire five hours that Destiny was wildly on side of his depth. In fact, although many of the viral clips in the debate involved Destiny's humiliation at the hands of Norm Finkelstein, <laughs> The truth is that for most of the debate, he was kind of irrelevant, sitting like a child at the grown-ups table. His presence was nevertheless useful for helping to illustrate the combination of ignorance, willful blindness, and debate bro tricks of the trade that are required to fully defend the Israeli position at this point in time. Benny Morris and Destiny threw every propaganda device in the Hasbara playbook up against the wall to see what would stick. So let's see how it went in the face of what at this point is an undeniable and indefensible reality. So first up, any good Hasbara campaign has got to start with a fairy tale view of history. Now, in this history, the only permitted victims are Jewish people who no doubt were horribly victimized in the Holocaust. And in this history, the only 
the UK or Germany or the Soviet Union to provide justice, peace, and safety for the Jewish people, but rather to impose that burden entirely on a people who had nothing to do with the Holocaust. And, and this is why I thought it was important to play, uh, if we could pause it really quick. This is why I thought it was important to play that other Destiny clip before you even saw what Crystal had to say in her monologue, because he's going to throw a fit and say that, oh, you know, she's just doing a distorted, you know, version of history to undermine uh, the Palestinians. But in that last clip we played where he was debating Nathan Robinson for current affairs, he basically lays out multiple times that he is, in fact, unwilling to have any victim uh, or any nar- any victim narrative. But anyway, he's, in, he's un- absolutely unwilling to have any victims besides uh, the Jewish uh, residents of Israel. And meanwhile, he doesn't even begin to talk about the apartheid state, the, the system of uh, you know, intense segregation, right? That should set alarm bells off in any liberal's mind, though he completely ignores it, right? Like, oh, you believe in a two-tiered system for people just living their lives? Yeah. Do you want to go back to Jim Crow South, asshole? Like, that's essentially what you're advocating for. But I just thought it was important, um, you know, to harp on that one more time that he is legitimately unwilling to engage with any narrative that involves culpability for uh, you know the zionist uh you know, leadership in other words the only solution to a european atrocity was to give license to an additional atrocity the ethnic cleansing of the native arab palestinian population from their own land the only acceptable response of that palestinian population was then to meekly accept their dispossession to do otherwise is to prove that arabs from the beginning were violent unreasonable and anti-semitic this was a matter of quite a lot of debate at the beginning of the podcast here, for example, is Destiny challenging the idea that expulsion or ethnic cleansing was a core and necessary element of Zionism from the outset. A claim that gets brought up a lot has to do with the inevitability of transfer in Zionism or the idea that as soon as the Jews envisioned a state in Palestine, they knew that it would involve some mass transfer of population, perhaps a mass expulsion. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about Plan Dalit or Plan D at some point. The issue that I run into is while you can find quotes from leaders, while you can find maybe desires expressed in diaries, I feel like it's hard to truly ever know if there would have been mass transfer in the face of Arab peace, because I feel like every time there was a huge deal on the table that would have had a sizable Jewish and Arab population living together, the Arabs would reject it out of hand. So, for instance, when we say that transfer was inevitable, when we say that Zionists would have never. OK, that's so crazy you know, to say. Let me pull this away for a second. That's so crazy to say, because the reason immediately people will tell you right off of the bat that there can't be a one state solution is because there'd be way more Palestinians than Jewish people in Israel. Right. If you were just, oh, hey, let's just have a democratic solution yeah uh they they, that would never fly that's why that's not even on the table and then you want to talk about how there's no examples of forced ethnic cleansing there's no examples of forced removal or an attempt to forcibly remove how about making it so everybody who fucking lives there has to live in abject subjugation oh hey you want to live under a little less scrutiny move to the west bank oh wait actually no we're taking over the west bank now too Oh, yes, we're going to move the uh, uh, the embassy to Jerusalem. That's not an antagonistic maneuver. Oh, yeah, we're going to start, you know, f- forcing people out of uh, their homes and, you know, a- you know, neighborhoods that they've lived in for hundreds of years like Sheikh Jarrah. Those aren't examples of forcing people out. No, that, that's just development. We see development in America. We developed the Native Americans right out. That wasn't genocide, right? Oh, yes, it was. And that's it was an ethnic cleansing. And that's exactly what we're watching unfold here. Uh, so anyway, I just pa- uh, paused to jump in there, Gavin, while you were gone, because I think it's fucking ridiculous to say that he, you know, he's like, well, I don't really think that there's been much of a clear effort to, you know, uh, remove the Palestinian population. In fact, that, you know, Israeli population's always been jubilant about sharing their fucking society with the Palestinians. You know, there's no anti-Arab or Islamophobic sentiments held by their people. That would be nuts. So, for instance, when we say that transfer was inevitable, when we say that Zionists would have never accepted, you know, a sizable Arab population, how do you explain the acceptance of the 47 partition plan that would have had a huge Arab population living in the Jewish state? Is your contention that after the acceptance of that, after the establishment of that state, that Jews would have slowly started to expel all of these Arab citizens from their country? Or how do you explain that in Lausanne a couple of years later that Israel was willing to formally annex the Gaza Strip and make 200,000 or so people no citizens but i but i'm, I'm just curious how, oh, how do we God. get this idea could you imagine Zionism saying that right now pause this again please please pause this again he said oh if they were willing to invite 
are you? I can't believe these words came out of his mouth. It's appalling to say. I can't believe it. He says, oh, they were willing to invite all of the people of Gaza Strip to keep them in a fucking prison, not let them leave. Like this was some sort of humanitarian effort. Like this was some sort of an olive branch to the Palestinian people. Are you fucking kidding me? And then what happened? And then what happened? What did they do? Destiny, go on. Go on. What's happening right fucking now? Yeah, they're destroying it. They're bombing it to smithereens. Yeah. They're starving all the people there. They're cutting off the medication. You know, it's become such a problem that the United Arab Emirates is trying to draw a moral line in the sand for them. Okay, let me say that again. The Emiratis of all next, it's going to be like, oh, oh, yeah, we have to look to the beacon of Qatar to say, hey, guys, this is too much. It's <laughs> gone too far. Yeah. yeah. Are you? kidding me i can't even imagine that of course they annexed it and then what did they do they're forcibly removing everybody what is they what if they said oh don't worry they can just leave gaza what does benjamin netanyahu always say the people they're free to leave go south go to egypt go to lebanon go to another place right as if it's so easy just abandon your that's what an ethnic cleansing is and that's why you have guys like jared kushner out here openly speculating about the property value of the gaza waterfront properties that could be brought in right and then meanwhile people are talking to you about how donald trump is going to be an anti-war president as if he's going to like negotiate an immediate peace deal you know what he's going to do he's going to say that netanyahu finished the shit quick okay yep. get all these people out of there and uh, i want a cut of those properties give them over to jerick and ivanka okay yep. that's what he would do that's what he would do okay and he would be like bb don't forget about the fucking jerusalem and the deal did, did you like working with joe biden did you like working with joe biden like you know anyway of course he liked working with joe biden because joe biden was a doormat but that's another conversation transfer when there were times at least early on in the history of israel and, and a little bit before it where israel would have accepted a state that would have had a massive arab population in it is your yeah is your idea that they would have just slowly expelled them afterwards yes in fact expulsion or apartheid is the only logical outcome of establishing a jewish state in a land that was and is majority muslim arab zionist leaders at the time were pretty open about this and about the necessity of violence and conflict with that indigenous population for example joseph weitz head of the jewish agency's colonization department said in 1940 quote between ourselves it must be clear that there is no room for both peoples together in this country we shall not achieve our goal if the arabs are in this small country there is no other way than to transfer the arabs from here to neighboring countries all of them not one village not one tribe should be left so pretty clear cut and there are plenty of other historical quotes besides that that make it clear early Zionist leaders realized their ideology would inevitably result in conflict with Palestinians. Some acknowledged that Arab resistance was in fact logical and even just, and that they would also fervently resist displacement if the roles had been reversed. To piggyback on what Crystal's saying, right, and th thread the needle with the broader point that we've been making on this podcast, which is that they can't come out and say all this shit, right? They can't come out and say all that shit because Americans would, you know, by and large be like, wait, our, our propaganda has said that we wouldn't support that. We don't, we don't believe in that anymore we're not here to support people forcibly being displaced we just fought a war a world world war ii about that why would we why would we do that so the united states government said here's what we're going to do everybody let's get to cooking we desperately want israel to succeed because we want to have a little beacon right there by egypt syria lebanon all that shit perfect right by iran up in their ass cricks right so we want to have that there but the American people, especially after the Holocaust and all of that imagery, they're really fucking not into the idea of forced displacement of a lot of people. Here's I got it. I'll cook this up. They all love Jerusalem. These people are Christian as shit. Let's just say I've got an idea for the slogan, a land with no people a people with no land hey that has a ring to it well too bad all of the lands we want have people on it but dad don't let that get in the way of a good slogan let's run with that in america nobody lived there where did all the people go it was the holy land for the jews just awaiting them nobody was there people no, jerusalem i know you'd think it would be a bustling community at this point thousands of year old city no nobody there it was completely it was like amish country no i'm kidding uh <laughs> anyway um that was obviously a lie First. Now, it is this point about the reasonable and, in fact, inevitable nature of Palestinian resistance to Zionism that Moeen Rabani picks up on. In doing so, he lays waste to the idea that Palestinians, in rejecting the original 1948 UN partition plan, were out of line, or even that it was inherently anti-Semitic to reject a Jewish state being established on a portion of their land at all. I mean, um, uh, one doesn't have to sympathize with the Palestinians um, to recognize that they have now been a stateless people for 75 years. Can you name any country 
yours, for example, or yours, that would be prepared to give 55%, 25%, 10% of your country to the Palestinians? Of course not. And so um, the issue was not the existence of Jews in Palestine. Um, they had been I'd like to make a radical century. suggestion. And of course they had ties to Palestine. After much thought, it will be difficult, but I'm prepared to offer Texas as a uh, you know future home for any uh, any uh, any supporters of uh, you know Zionism who feel like the only way to be safe is to be in Israel. No, you can all move to Texas, and you know we'll just you know disown them and be a reverse Alamo. It would be wonderful. <laughs> and particularly to Jerusalem and, and other places, going back centuries, if not millennia. Um, but the idea of establishing an exclusively Jewish state at the expense of those who are already living there, I think it was right to reject that. And I don't think we can look back now, 75 years later, and say, well, you should have been 55% of your homeland because you ended up losing 78% of it in the addition, and the remaining 22% was occupied in 1967. That's that's not how things work. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I can I can imagine mm -hmm. I can imagine an American rejecting giving 10% of the United States to the Palestinians. And if that rejection leads to war and you lose half your country, I doubt that 50 years from now you're going to say, well, maybe I should have accepted that. So they didn't accept the establishment of an explicitly Jewish state because the inevitable outcome was some version of exactly the apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and now out-and-out -out genocide that we are seeing play out. This was a point that Norman Finkelstein made quite eloquently, talking about the version of nationalism Zionism represents. Most. So yeah, I think you guys kind of get the point here. I mean, a lot of clips from this debate, good stuff, but I think it's pretty wild for Destiny to have characterized this radar from Crystal as, you know, containing so much information, the most misinformation he's ever heard in his entire life, that Crystal didn't even bother to watch the debate herself, even though she's specifically and repeatedly referencing moments from the debate. Highlights she watched more than we did. Clearly, yeah, she seems to really have an understanding of what went down in this discussion. And although I have not watched the entire debate in its six hours, I've seen enough of it to get the sense that she was pretty fucking on like pretty freaking on point. Uh, I don't I don't really disagree with anything I've heard her say so far. Um, I don't think she's been inaccurate. It seems like she's describing the dynamic of this debate very accurately, in my opinion. So, yeah, it's pretty wild that Destiny just, you know, completely smeared her, essentially, saying she's spreading misinformation and stuff when she was just giving her opinion and reacting to the debate in which you were humiliated in. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, speaking to this first point where he's talking about discussing this with Crystal or Sagar, Zach, do you think that actually might happen? Do you think that Crystal and or Sagar will actually try to set this up and sit down, hash it out with Destiny? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that there's a good chance that that would be fucking incredible content for them. And I'm not a betting man, but I know how YouTube works and the incentive to make incredible content is a pretty big one. Uh, I think it would be worthwhile. And I don't think that Destiny... like. It, Destiny will come off as so fucking unlikable being rude to Crystal because Crystal's such a lovely woman. Like, you know what I mean? Like, she's just such a nice, like, you know, she gives, like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't mean this in like a disrespectful way, quite the opposite, but she gives off such like natural mom energy. And he <laughs> would just come off as such a brat, like yeah. a fucking loser, if uh, you, uh, you know, just, you know, kind of molded like he's prone to during his debate, that like bratty, you know, kind of college freshman style. Yeah. he has i don't think destiny knows what he's getting himself into because to your point zach crystal is an incredible debater she's actually handily destroyed several opponents she doesn't do a lot of debates but when she does she almost always just eviscerates her opponent you guys might remember the infamous bill maher clip that we that we reacted to at the time of her just like destroying bill maher um i remember back in the rising days when they would have on like establishment hacks and you know tools from like the you know joe biden campaign or the donald trump campaign she would just like clean the floor um she's actually really talented at debating i wish uh, i wish that crystal debated more because she's such a, a great ring 
Yeah, exactly. She's so good at it, um, but she doesn't do it a lot. And if Destiny thinks she's going to be easy to handle, you know, oh, I'll just go in there and, and bully her or something. I don't think he understands what's coming. Yep, 100%.